Welcome to the Blue Dot Project podcast, where we share ideas for building regenerative cultures and communities that enable life to thrive on Earth for thousands of years. I'm your host, David Veronica. If you or your loved ones often eat food produced in the United States, you will learn here today that many of the foods you eat may be much less safe than you think. Today, we focus on the work of a nonprofit group in the United States that has enlisted a private, independent laboratory to test the safety and nutritional value of everyday foods. Their findings will give you plenty to think about. I'd like you to meet Zen Honeycutt, founder of Moms Across America and author of the book Unstoppable. This GMO monocrop agriculture farming system that we currently have is devastating for the American food supply today. The standard American diet which consists of things like school lunches, 30 million school meals are served per day to our children. 93% of them were positive for glyphosate. GMOs are genetically modified organisms. Glyphosate is the active ingredient in many herbicides, including one marketed in the United States as Roundup. Many scientific and regulatory bodies around the world have evaluated the health risks of glyphosate with mixed results. Glyphosate's critics believe it probably causes cancer in humans and may also act as an endocrine disruptor, leading to reproductive issues and developmental problems. It may have adverse effects on the nervous system, possibly causing Parkinson's disease, and it may cause inflammatory bowel disease. If you're an impact investor who's considering whether to fund regenerative initiatives, how is this information about food safety relevant to your financial interests? The relevant story behind this story is the growing market for regenerative and organic food products. Granted, the market for regenerative food products is small today. Regenerative food production is a tiny fraction of all food produced in the world. Most consumers have never heard of regenerative farming, and even fewer understand what it is or why it's important to them. But by the end of this episode, you'll better understand the need to change the way food is produced, and you'll see the benefits of regenerative farming, especially when it's linked to organic farming. A growing awareness of the adverse health effects of bad food is driving more consumers to demand better, safer, more nutritious food. U.S. sales of organic foods more than doubled in dollar volume from 2013 to 2022, from about $30 billion a year to almost $62 billion. Certified organic food now accounts for about 6% of total food sales in the United States. Food produced through regenerative farming can help meet the growing demand for safer food. As consumers turn away from brands that sell foods they believe are unsafe or unhealthful, brands that sell such foods will lose sales and market share. To protect their business, those brands will require their growers to use regenerative farming processes. As that happens, more farmers will have a powerful economic incentive to switch to regenerative practices. That transition toward regenerative food production should strengthen the economies of communities that encourage and enable regenerative farming practices. In this episode, we'll address these questions. Number one, how unhealthful is food produced in the United States? Number two, why is the quality of so much food produced in the United States so open to question? Number three, who says American food quality is often questionable? And what evidence can they cite? Number four, what are some likely health and social consequences of low food quality? Number five, what's being done to fix these problems? And number six, What are the implications for regenerative food production? The topic of regenerative agriculture versus industrial agriculture is big and deserves more than one podcast episode, so we'll cover it in the future. In the United States, responsibility for food safety is divided among various agencies at the federal, state, and local levels. Each of these agencies has its own responsibilities for monitoring and protecting different aspects of food safety. State level and municipal authorities are also responsible for ensuring food safety locally. (music) 
Let's return to Zen Honeycutt. When we left her a moment ago, she was sharing the test results from an independent laboratory that moms across America had hired to evaluate school lunches in the United States. 74% had pesticides in them, up to 29 different pesticides. 100% had heavy metals, which are neurotoxic and carcinogenic, and very, very low minerals. We also had an aviary contraceptive found in four of the school lunches served to our children. Zen's organization has also tested fast food from restaurants. 76% had multiple pesticides in them, 100% had heavy metals, and 47% of the top 10 fast foods that we tested contain butanidiol, which is a central nervous system depressant and actually says on the manufacturer standard that it causes combativeness. They had very low levels of minerals and veterinary drugs and hormones, antibiotics that cause the hind legs of dogs and horses to go paralyzed, and the aviary contraceptive was found in Chick-fil-A sandwiches. For context, Chick-fil-A is a fast food chain focused mainly in the southern states of the United States. Heavy metals include about 70 elements that appear on the periodic table of elements. Some of those heavy metals are essential for human health, but agencies monitor food for the presence of lead, mercury, cadmium, chromium, and arsenic because they are heavy metals that are highly toxic to humans. Zen says food testing commissioned by moms across America also found heavy metals in cereals from General Mills. Some of these levels are between 1,000 to 6,000 times higher than what the EPA allows in drinking water. And the EPA, nor the FDA, they're currently not regulating heavy metals in our food supply. They're only regulating a few, like lead, heavy metals in apple juice, baby food, and in candy. And so these heavy metals are feeding 30 million GMO school lunchers a day, and 85 million Americans are eating fast food a day. So we're extremely concerned about the contamination of heavy metals and pesticides. 100% of the baby formulas we tested, 20 different brands, two of each brand, 100% were positive for aluminum and lead. 80% had levels of lead that were above what the EPA deems safe. And without any regulation of heavy metals, we are slowly being poisoned with these heavy metal toxins that cause cancer and neurological damage, which can be lifelong and permanent. We need to do something about it because the sources for the school lunches and fast food don't just supply to school lunches and fast food. They supply to pretty much all of the restaurants across America, and they supply to the grocery stores. The levels of toxins that are being found in our food supply, I believe, and many people believe, are the major contributing factor of sickness in America today. The Food and Drug Administration asserts that the U.S. food supply is among the safest in the world. Even so, food products in the United States are not tested as widely or as thoroughly as you might think. Proper food testing is an enormous task, and it's expensive. Collectively, the government bodies responsible for food safety are not fully funded or staffed to check all food products consistently. As recently as the 1990s, the typical U.S. supermarket carried about 7,000 items. Today, supermarkets carry 40,000 to 50,000 items. Not all of these items are food products, but most are. For accurate results, the agencies must test dozens of samples across multiple food batches. Moreover, the agencies don't necessarily test for all the relevant factors related to food safety and public health. The FDA's website says the agency is working to understand the occurrence of PFAS in the general food supply by testing for certain PFAS chemicals. These are the so-called forever chemicals that are thought to cause cancer, reproductive and developmental defects, immune deficiencies, interference with hormones, increased cholesterol levels, and liver damage. They've been found consistently in human blood samples, liver tissues, kidneys, breast milk, and fatty body tissues. All the agencies responsible for food safety are subject to lobbying by big food and big agriculture. Companies such as the former Monsanto, now part of Bayer AG, are known for their aggressive lobbying efforts with regulatory agencies. 
They worked to ensure that government standards did not limit or preclude the use of their products. In response to these food industry influencers, government agencies may set thresholds that are arguably too low to properly protect public health. What about organic foods? If Moms Across America has tested any organics, what were the results? The organic foods have much lower levels of glyphosate and pesticides. They do sometimes have levels of heavy metals, which are very concerning, and even in some cases have higher levels of heavy metal in organics than conventional. And this has been explained to us because of the fact that organic farmers cannot use straight up synthetic chemicals like phosphorus or nitrogen or, you know, those types of things that the conventional farmers can use. So they have to use manure. And when they use manure, they are allowed to use manure from confined animal feeding operations. And those animals are eating GMO grains, which are sprayed with glyphosate, Roundup, Ranger Pro, and those herbicides have been found to contain heavy metals. So we believe that the petroleum products in these farming inputs are ending up in the feces of these animals, and then it ends up in organic farming. And the organic baby food and organic other types of foods can have some of the highest levels of heavy metals out of all the foods tested. So we have a serious heavy metal issue also in organic, and that's why we say that the entire food supply needs to be transformed. Since the 1960s and 70s, food production in the United States has changed dramatically. In corn production, annual use of herbicides rose from about 10 million pounds of active ingredients in the 1960s to over 100 million pounds by the early 2000s. Glyphosate use saw a 15-fold increase from 1996 to 2014. The acreage of genetically modified crops in the United States has exploded since their introduction in the mid-1990s. Large-scale concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, C-A-F-Os, are facilities where livestock are fed in confinement rather than grazing openly on grasses and local vegetation. Farmers now use antibiotics to fight disease among closely confined livestock. They also use the drugs to increase the growth rate for animals. Traces of those antibiotics often appear in the food we eat, and they contribute to the formation of antibiotic-resistant strains of bacteria. Finally, soils have become depleted of nutrients because of industrial farming methods. Soil depletion reduces the range and quantity of nutrients available to be absorbed into crops, so the nutritional value of foods has declined. In addition, crop breeders have often developed new varieties for their commercial advantages rather than for their nutritional value. Many food crops today are easier to ship and store. They have longer shelf life, they ripen at more desirable rates, and they don't bruise as much as they did but they are often less nutritious. Big Food and Big Ag have their own studies showing that the food they provide is safe to consume. The situation is reminiscent of the battles between tobacco companies, their plaintiffs, and regulatory agencies in the 1960s through the 1990s. The book Merchants of Doubt chronicles how tobacco companies then used their sponsored research to cast doubt on other research that suggested tobacco is addictive and causes cancer. Who are you going to trust in such an environment? Will you accept testing done by government agencies that are understaffed and subject to political pressure? Do you feel more confident with testing done by big ag and big food companies that feel bound to serve their shareholders first? Or will you trust testing done by privately funded nonprofit organizations working with independent labs that are not subject to the politics of regulatory agencies? What are Zen Honeycutt's credentials to evaluate food quality? She sees herself as a well-educated, well-informed, and tenacious mom who can choose a reliable food testing lab. And she has a knack for organizing people and getting the word out. 
I am not a scientist, but I do have access to probably uh, over 100 scientists that we are on email threads and communicate with consistently about the new science. And I feel honored to be able to collaborate with scientists that ha are experts in this area and have been doing scientific studies on glyphosate and many other toxic chemicals for decades. I think my contribution is to be able to communicate the science in a way that the mainstream public can absorb it and get the word out so that people can be informed and make choices about what they're eating and how they're choosing their food in the grocery store or in their communities in a way that's healthier for their families. Or first and foremost, we at Moms Across America are concerned with the health and safety of our children and future generations. And what we're seeing today, as I'm sure many of your listeners are aware of, 54% of children today have a chronic illness. One out of two men and one out of three women are expected to get cancer. We have one out of five people with mental health problems. One out of six of our children have learning disorders. So I'm very concerned about the future that we are leaving our children. And I think the number one way we can do something about this is to clean up the food supply. Two main initiatives for moms across America are to, number one, expand their food testing program, and number two, to increase their consumer education program to communicate the results and the importance of their testing. There's so much more testing that we would like to do, and I believe that that type of testing is exposing what's going on in the food supply so that we can then do something about it. Um, so we need some very committed people that would fund that testing. When testing shows high levels of contaminants in food products, Zen hopes the brands will pressure the Environmental Protection Agency. All the brands that sell chickpea products, we hope, will get together and tell the EPA, you've got to stop allowing this herbicide to be sprayed on chickpeas before harvest because it is contaminating our food products and hurting our business. And when we have people come together and say, this cannot happen anymore, then we're going to see policy change and we're going to see a shift in the marketplace. Uh -huh. But if the EPA does not do that, then it's up to the brands to pressure the suppliers to say, we need a supply without these types of levels. Who does Zen think will lead the drive? for higher quality, safer food. It'll be the consumers first. We'll be the ones saying, we don't want this. And then we'll be telling the brands, this needs to change. And then hopefully the brands will work with us or work together on their own and tell the suppliers, this needs to change. Moms Across America also partners with other organizations that advocate for a safer food supply. You know, we have wonderful organizations like Kiss the Ground, stating that they want to transform 100 million acres to regenerative organic agriculture. Those are underway. The government has funded uh, to the tune of $300 million to transition to regenerative agriculture. To be clear, food produced regeneratively and food produced organically are two different things. Organic foods must meet certain governmental regulatory standards. For instance, they can't include genetically modified organisms. They can't use synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. But organic food standards say nothing about growing foods in ways that promote soil health or increase biodiversity. Regenerative farming, like organic farming, excludes use of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. But it also goes beyond that. It incorporates practices such as no-till planting, continual use of cover crops, and rotational grazing of livestock to aerate and fertilize fields. As yet, the United States has established no regulatory standards for regenerative food production. About five organizations are proposing non-government certification standards for regenerative foods, each with its own variations. Zen advocates a new certification for foods that are produced both regeneratively and organically. And we think that's a huge opportunity for not only the consumer to be educated about what regenerative organic agriculture is, but to create a demand and support and to support transitioning the marketplace to regenerative organic agriculture. So we are focused now on expanding the awareness of consumers to transition the marketplace to regenerative organic agriculture, just like we have been for the past 12 years in doing that for the organic marketplace. Zen started Moms Across America in 2013 in an effort to get food producers to label products that contain genetically modified organisms. 
and we had banners and we joined into Fourth of July parades to reach thousands locally and millions nationally in a single day. And we did this to raise awareness about GMOs, just to have somebody wonder what's a GMO and to look it up. And we did. We reached millions of people that day and had over 600 leaders create over a thousand events and ended up being in all 50 states within the first five years of inception. And we did this to shift the marketplace to organic. And Moms Across America, I believe, has been a major contributing factor to uh, that increase of organic sales because we have had thousands of moms who have initiated events locally, whether they be speaker series or joining in parades, movie nights. We've also reached over the past six years, it's been 78 million impressions on social media. And so we're estimating at least 120 million through just Facebook and you know Twitter and Instagram alone. And we've been in over a dozen movies, international movies. I've spoken in about a dozen countries internationally. I've toured throughout Asia and um, Australia, New Zealand, and Europe, many different countries. My book has been published in the United States and in Japan. And we believe that the moms that are speaking up in playgrounds and parking lots and backyard barbecues are the ones that are shifting the marketplace to organic, which is the fastest growing industry in any of any marketplace. And we'd like to do the same for generative organic. Now we see a huge need to be able to switch those farming practices. Here are the main takeaways from today's episode. Food quality and safety have declined in large part because of the growth of highly processed foods and the widespread adoption of industrial farming methods over the past 60 years. Number two, the inconsistent quality of food contributes to medical and social problems and the costs that come with them. Number three, we can reduce or eliminate many of these problems and their costs by switching to regenerative organic farming methods. Number four, Farmers are likely to resist the transition to regenerative organic methods unless their customers, that is, food companies and food consumers, demand better quality. Number five, once the demand for regenerative organic food begins to grow faster, so will the adoption of regenerative organic food production. And number six, investors who anticipate the shift in demand will be in a better position to see a good return on their investment in enabling the change. You can reach Zen Honeycutt at her website at momsacrossamerica.com. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Blue Dot Project podcast, please consider sharing it with friends and colleagues. Also consider signing up to receive notification of future episodes. If you'd like to keep up with other timely news about investing in regenerative initiatives, also check out the Blue Dot Brief on Substack. A new issue comes out every two weeks. Next time, we'll talk with Nicole Reese, who for six years has been active in the movement to build regenerative communities. You'll hear her thoughts on where this movement is heading and her observations on the essentials for effective communities. Thanks to our outstanding post-production team, Fibolian Demay and Maria Di Pace. I'm David Vronikar. See you next time.